So an experimental summary, each of the types of results individually, this is not my slide, it's uh, Dave Nagel's slide from the course given at uh, George Washington University last week in, in, on cold fusion. Each of these things, measurement of large excess heat, systematics seen for uh, heat production, the heat goes up in response to rational variables like more loading, um, uh, more uh, stimulus at the interface. Helium can be produced. We've produced here at SRI both helium-3 and helium-4 and tritium. And the heat and helium can be correlated. Tritium can be produced. The tritium is produced in some experiments, but not all. And when it's observed, it's observed to be about four or five orders of magnitude, even, even six. So, you know, between 100,000 and a million times less than the amount of tritium that you would expect for a hot fusion reaction. So whatever we're seeing is not cold hot fusion. But tritium is produced and can only be produced in a nuclear uh, uh, process. Neutrons have been measured in burst. This is the only thing on this slide that we haven't measured at SRI. We do have a neutron spectrometer, but we've never really used it in anger. <laughs> if I did use it, it would be in anger. Um, observations, both X-rays and gamma rays. MeV uh, uh, charged particles have been measured. You can see craters on cathodes. Hot spots have been measured. The effect seems to be heterogeneous. If you look at an uh, operating surface with a, a thermal imaging camera, you'll see little bright lights winking into existence and then uh, winking out. It's a hard experiment. Very few people have done that. Um, people claim that new elements have been measured in, in helium-3, helium-4, or tritium are new elements, but there's a sub-branch of condensed matter nuclear science which focuses more on transmutation, as somebody asked uh, before. Uh, that's not something we have either any great skill at observing uh, or have spent very much time uh, pursuing, but certainly that's claimed, and it would obviously be nuclear. The question is, are there any uh, uh, commercial, is there a real commercial opportunity? With the deuterium-palladium system, the commercial opportunity looks tenuous. The nickel-lyhydrogen system, the commercial opportunity looks such that if I had a large amount of money, I might think about investing in it. Conclusions. It's nice to offer this conclusion, because this was our initial hypothesis. This is what we started this whole thing with in, in um, you know, April, May of 1989, that an unexpected source of heat can be observed in the deuterium-palladium system when deuterium is loaded electrochemically into the palladium lattice to a sufficient uh, degree. And uh, that is a conclusion. So we tested the hypothesis. The hypothesis tested out. This really is indeed the case. It is possible to initiate nuclear reactions with chemical energies. Interesting. Uh, Twenty odd years ago, when I talked to my physicist friends, they said that's preposterous. But it does seem that that is possible, which is interesting and opens up new fields. The reactions yield significant power and energy. Current major scientific problems, well, reproducibility and controllability. Obviously, you're not going to make and sell a product. If you don't know what the mechanism is, it's nuclear, you don't know what the mechanism is, and, and it, it does what it wants when it wants. Uh, this is, you know, a car that behaved like that would not be um, marketable, at least not in this country. Uh, Um, exciting, potentially historic possibilities. Distributed nuclear power sources. You know, if Rossi, Piantelli, and company are correct, we can imagine they operate at 400 degrees centigrade. 400 is a nice spot for steam generators or something of that sort. But uh, the, the thing about cold fusion, if, if, if you let me have uh, my, my rose-colored glasses on for a second. And the nice thing about it is that it operates small. Its sweet spot seems to be, you know, a kilowatt to 10 kilowatts. So it does not seem to be logi logically compatible with what Rossi is trying to do at one megawatt. Why? Why? Uh, at one kilowatt, 10 kilowatts, you can power a home. You know, 100 kilowatts, you know, a small village or apartment building or hospital or something and have a, a decentralized uh, grid which would relieve a lot of pressure on our infrastructure. Uh, home heating, electricity, they, they, when I did that thing on 60 Minutes, they tortured me with questions until I finally gave them an answer that was 
compatible with their audience. And I said that maybe in 20 years we could have portable power for electronics. Well, maybe in 20 years, uh, maybe in 20 years we can have portable power for electronics. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, transport systems. Um, so uh, I thank you all for your attention. And and before. Um, asking, inviting questions, I've got to uh, acknowledge two things. One, the sponsors of all of this work. EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, MITI, the Japanese Ministry of uh, Industry and Technological Innovation, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and uh, DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, have sponsored 90% of the work that I talked about. And uh, I, I know it's going to come as a shock to you, but I didn't actually do all of the work that I talked about. <laughs> um, others, many, many, many others. SRI has put about 65 person years into this activity. It's, it's not been a small activity at SRI. Uh, a lot of these people contributed a lot of time, particularly uh, Fran Tanzella, who is here, uh, deserves a special call out because he's been doing it consistently for... 22 ideas. <laughs> Thank you, friend. Thank you all.